Alrighty, so today, as the last Thailand video that I'm gonna do, because I think next weekend's gonna be hectic and I probably won't be able to make a video, um, I wanted to make sure that I at least talked about a really famous mathematical object called the Penrose Thailand, but I had a huge issue with trying to construct it. And the reason for that is that one of the main objects in the Penrose Thailand is a regular pentagon. So one of the things that makes constructing a regular pentagon hard, or at least if you're like me and you've never attempted to draw a regular pentagon before and you wanna to try to understand a mathematical object that has a ton of regular pentagons in it, the one thing that's hard about drawing that object is that all of the angles are 108 degrees. Um, and it's not super straightforward to go about constructing a 108 degree angle. And so, as I was sitting in my chair last Sunday thinking about it, I also realized that the game, or rather dev kit, Dreams came out on the PS4. And that has been something that I have super nerded out about for the past five years and have been waiting for it to come out. And of course, the first thing that I would think to do with that platform would be to make the Penrose Highline. So here was how plan one was gonna work out. The Penrose Highline is constructed with essentially four different types of tiles. There are regular pentagons, there are these rhombuses, and then there are these weird crowns, and then there are pentagrams or five point stars. And one of the ways you can think about the Penrose Highline is that it's one of the ways that you can fit the most pentagons in the plane. So wherever you can place a pentagon, you try to place one of your regular pentagons. And the only caveat here is that you can't use multiple sizes of pentagons. You only have to use one regular pentagon of a certain size. So when I first went into Dreams to go and construct this, I decided to do it by hand. Okay, so to start off, I just need a pentagon. So it's probably gonna be, where, where are we? Yeah, sculpting and, oh. That's unfortunate. I, I I guess there's no Pentagon. Thank God to the one human that made a perfect Pentagon somewhere in dreams already. A plus to that human. So the next hurdle was, of course, doing this by hand. What's hard is you lose a lot of your precision when you're doing anything by hand, especially when you're trying to construct something that has very rigorously defined mathematical properties. Um, and so, after about two days of spending time in dreams after work. Okay, so this is this is definitely taking way too much time and it's not super precise at all. And I really don't wanna have to place another 200 of these by hand. So there's gotta be another way to do this. It just, mm. it looks cool though. So I guess that's a plus, but this is still not great. And I would deem this a failure of process. So I guess I've already talked through my first failure, but I haven't really talked through why I'm building the Penrose tiling at all, right? So just before I go into the second method that got me to a Penrose tiling, I won't, should probably tell you what the cool thing about this thing is. So the Penrose tiling has this really cool property that ended up actually going into the applied world and realizing itself as the development of quasi-crystals by Dan Schechtman, who ended up winning the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his discovery of real life quasi-crystals. Um, so a quasi-crystal, to keep it physical, is a structure that has repeating structures within it, but the repetitions don't happen in a regular interval. So what that means is that, say for example, I don't know, you were to run into some carbon structure in this quasi-crystal. What would happen then within the quasi-crystal is that that structure of carbon that you found would repeat itself somewhere else in the structure, but it wouldn't happen regularly. So you might have to go like 100 molecules out to hit the first repetition of it, and then 70 out to hit the next repetition of it. and that's mostly a one dimensional realization of it, but you can do the same thing in two dimensions. So the important thing here is that those repetitions are bounded. So there's going to be a limit to how much you have to look 
for the next repetition, but again, it doesn't have to regularly occur at any one value in that range of possible radii between repetitions of those molecules. The Penrose tiling is a quasi-crystal-like structure like this, where when you're looking at the tiles, if you look at a local structure of tiles in the tiling, that pattern of tiles will recur, but it won't recur regularly. It'll recur in these bounded intervals where the distance between them can be different throughout the tiling. And so to get a better idea of how the Penrose tiling works, it is one good to first be able to generate it, which is something I've struggled to do for most of my mathematical life up until this point. And two, it's good to kind of walk around locally on it. So that's what I strove to do with the second iteration. So I went back to the drawing board because I was pretty sure that there was another way that you could construct the Penrose tiling. And I was right. As it turns out, the Penrose tiling can be partially constructed with an iterated function system. So if you're unaware, an iterated function system is a way of evaluating multiple functions repeatedly on one set. So the most common place that I've seen this done has been with polygons. So if you were to take a square and you had four different functions that sort of contract the square and move it around, you could continually iterate that function on this square. And the first time you iterate it, you'll get four different squares that end up in these different places. And then the next time you iterate, you'll get 16 different squares. And then you'll get 64 different squares and then 256 different squares. And the iteration process exponentially grows the number of squares that you have, but also you're getting smaller and smaller squares as if, if, your mapping is a contraction or hyperbolic in that sense of the word. So for the Penrose tiling, the iterated function system is actually quite simple to grasp. So what it does is it takes the pentagon, which I, you, I don't know why I put my hands up here. I'm just gonna go to the board where I can show the cutout of a pentagon. So again, it takes a pentagon and it sends it to six different pentagons all 38% of the size of the original. And the reason I'm saying 38% of the size is because it's actually like one over the golden mean in size. I think that's right. I will check that and put it here somewhere, but I'm pretty sure that's correct. No, it is one over the golden mean squared. And so that iterated function system is actually really easy to realize in dreams. All I had to do was take the pentagon shape and then scale it down by 38% and then place them inside the original pentagon and then repeat that process by taking those new six pentagons and scaling them down even further. The only problem with this though is that when you do this repeatedly it doesn't fully realize the Penrose tiling in the original of there being pentagons, crowns, pentagrams and rhombi included. So in order to fix that, as I iterated, I had to add these pentagons on the end. The only thing left to do was to go ahead and iterate this a few more times and get everything lined up appropriately. So I went ahead and did that. And then I also colored it to match or to try to match the coloring from the Wikipedia image. Then I cleaned up the bottom and made sure that I added a little dude so that you could walk around and explore the tiling locally. The tiles lighting up is sort of a gimmick, but the one thing that's cool about having the little dude running around is that Penrose tiling is almost periodic, like I mentioned before. Being able to move around and do stuff on the tiling and having the heights sort of mirror what's going on with the iterated function system makes it so that you can get a better sense of what the local properties of the tiling are, even though they might not be super interesting at a small scale like this. but. Nevertheless, I thought it was pretty cool. It definitely helped me wrap my brain around what was going on with the Penrose tiling construction and how that actually worked. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this video. It was a lot of fun to make. Uh, and I know that I was also able to talk about some pretty cool math things while doing it. So if you did enjoy this video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos uh, that are mathy. I do a lot of math stuff on this channel, but if you enjoyed this little foyer into something else, it's something that I'm looking into doing a little bit more and 
keeping it more like mathy and computer sciencey and whatnot. Uh, especially Dreams is a great avenue to do sort of like models and building things like that in there, which I think is pretty cool. Um, and I'm hoping to do more stuff like that. So yeah, uh, that's, that's really all I got for you today. I'm gonna end this with a clip of the dude running around the tiling because that was, I don't know, that, that gave me joy when it happened. So yeah, that was a thing. But yeah, anyway, I'm Nathan. This was <laughs> partly chalk. I mean, there was the chalkboard showed up, so it is still chalk. Um, and I, I will see you next time.